Um, here we are. Uh, welcome, Coleman Hughes, to The Glenn Show. Great to be here. Great. Let me uh, start by introducing myself. Everybody may not know. I'm Glenn Lowry, professor of economics at Brown University. I am um, the host of The Glenn Show here at bloggingheads.tv, and I'm talking with uh, Coleman Hughes. And uh, Coleman, do you want to describe yourself for the audience? Sure. I'm a, I'm a philosophy student. Junior at Columbia University. I am a writer and um, from New Jersey. I'm also a musician. Uh, I think that's a potted summary of my background. Uh, a musician and undergraduate student at Columbia University, am I correct? That's right. A precocious undergraduate student, a person might say, in view of the fact that you've been um, out there um, on the internet, uh, uh, posting and, and writing, do you maintain a blog? Uh, I, I have one blog post, uh, it's called explaining affirmative action to a Martian. So um, there, you, there you are. Yeah. So I, I, I wouldn't say I keep a blog. I may end up, uh, putting more blog posts on there as time okay. goes on. Well, I guess you have to go to class and do some other things from time to time. Uh, people who, at the end of this conversation, are interested in knowing more about you, uh, I should mention, can find some of your writings at the site quillette.com, Q-U-I-L-L-E-T-T-E dot -E -E com, uh, where um, I'm told uh, contrarians have been given to voice their views. So, okay, um, <coughs> people are going to wonder, you know, what are you doing having an undergraduate student on your program? So the reason I'm having it is because I read some of your pieces and I've been very stimulated by them, including that single blog piece that you just mentioned, explaining affirmative action to a Martian. It's whimsical, it's satirical, it, it's biting, uh, it's sardonic. Uh, it, it has some things to say that I think are in need of being said. And even if I don't agree with every word, and I think I just might, but even if I didn't, I would be very happy to see um, a young African-American, uh, you know, writing and speaking out in this way. But uh, what? OK, how about we proceed like this? You tell me uh, uh, what you're trying to get at in some of this recent conservative friendly rumination ruminating that you've been doing about uh, race issues in the United States. What's, what's uh, keeping you awake at night or what's motivating you to, to stick your neck up out of the foxhole and speak out in the way that you've been doing? Well, first of all, just to get it out there, I voted for Hillary and have always viewed myself as sort of on the left, but obviously my opinions on race will make me seem like, a conservative or a Republican or a Trump supporter. Um, ultimately, I don't, I'm not that interested in, in politics and uh, uh, partisanship, but I think my writing for Quillette.com has been motivated by being, well, it's, it's somewhat personal. It's, it's motivated by being a, a young black person at Columbia where I'm expected to believe that I'm a victim of a either overtly or subtly racist campus, that I'm supposed to care about slight verbal missteps that white people might make um, in addressing racial issues. I'm supposed to absorb a, a kind of far left activist ideology about what this country should do. Uh, about the issue of, of racial inequality. And I find so much of it makes so little sense to me. And frankly, I find a lot of it makes little sense to many black people. But I, I, I also find that saying these things out loud, um, it just invites a firestorm your way. Uh, so it, it yeah, I mean, I I am so I'll I'll give you I'll give you some examples. Just be, being in, being in class at Columbia, I've been in a class where the teacher said to the whole class, "All student, all people of color are victims of oppression." Right. Well, this professor happened to be white, but it, it wouldn't have mattered if 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 she was black because I 
I don't define myself that way. I think it's, it's just untrue as a matter of fact for, for me and for most black people I know it's, it's profoundly disempowering and um, even somewhat offensive to be labeled in that way without one's permission. But to, if the social dynamic in the classroom was such that had I raised my hand and said, actually, I disagree, it would have been tantamount to social suicide. It, it would have been like, raising your hand in a classroom and saying, I slept with my sister or something. It, it would be that, it would be that, um, that contrarian and that you, you'd have to have, the, you'd have to be totally unsocialized as a human being uh, to say that. And not all classes are like this. That, that, that was an extreme case. There are other classes where with a little bit of courage, I could voice my opinion that I don't think racism is the, the biggest issue black people are facing. And I would, I would face some, some, uh, social friction, but it really depends what department you're in, what professor you happen to have. Uh, but yeah, my, 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 like you say, my conservative friendly opinions are coming from a place of feeling like I have a lot of liberal biases, but being frustrated with how insane the conversation has gotten about race. Okay. I, I hear a couple of things. I hear the substantive issue of the conversation claims that people are making, whether it's about victimization or it's about the nature of opportunity for African Americans, et cetera, about the criminal justice issues and the police. You didn't say that, but I could imagine that they might fit in there somehow about affirmative action for sure. So there's the substantive question of claims that people are making with which you disagree. And there's also another kind of question about who gets to be able to voice an opinion without being socially ostracized and you seem to be chafing against, again, I would not want to put words in your mouth, chafing against a conformity, a kind of uh, uh, like-mindedness that's uh, enforced through uh, practices of social ostracism and shaming that people of color are expected to affirm and with which you have, you take, uh, you take issue. You say you didn't vote for Trump. Why does that matter? Suppose you did. It, it shouldn't. It, it, it doesn't matter. It, it, why, just, then why did you tell me that? Well, I told you it because you described my writing as conservative friendly, which it is. And it, it is unapologetically. I, I just, I, I guess I, that, I, I wonder if that will get me any credit with any quote unquote liberal credit with people who would criticize my views. Um, maybe, maybe it isn't worth saying. Uh, well, it's definitely uh, a nod to the authority against which you seem to be chafing somewhat of uh, social conformity. It's, and I, again, I don't mean to impute anything to you. Please correct me if I say something that misrepresents. It's a little bit like, I don't want you all to think that I'm that kind of a person. Maybe you'll take more seriously what I'm saying right now if you don't, because if you thought that I was that kind of a person, an African-American who voted for Trump, you would perhaps legitimately discount everything that uh, I'm about to say. Mm -hmm. and, and I wonder, having read some of your stuff, uh, how, how you would square that with your, you know, with your fierce independence, which seems to require one, not that you were a Trump supporter, you were not, you've said so, take your extra word about that. But if you were, because there are, there are African-American Trump supporters, they're not mm -hmm. all fools or knaves, some of them are people thinking for themselves. Just like you, uh, you wouldn't join in an ostracism of someone who happened to be African American at Columbia and who was willing, I guess there aren't any, but if there were, to publicly affirm that they had supported Donald Trump. Can a black person support Donald Trump and still be somehow morally fit or something like that? Of course, I totally agree with everything you just said. And I think the reason I bring up that I, I, I voted for Hillary is because in the social context that I'm in, you can you can see eye to eye with someone on myriad issues politically. And if you so much as say that you don't think racism is a big issue for black people anymore, that is enough to bring a chill over the room. So what, what I'm saying is I, I happen to be the kind of person who would align with many, many liberal biases, certainly not all, maybe not even most, but just dissenting on the topic of race is enough to to invite 
a, a level of criticism and suspicion. I mean, God, God forbid if I were white, but I mean, for, for, for instance, I, I have a white friend. Uh, well, he is quote unquote white passing. He's an, an immigrant from South America. Great writer, Christian Gonzalez, writes for the National Review, fellow Columbia student of mine, and writes for the school newspaper. He is a, a, a conservative and um, a brilliant writer. He writes for the newspaper. There's He's tried to write about race, and his takes are virtually identical to mine. And he cannot get himself published as a columnist on the topic of race. He can write about other things but he'll submit the kind of argument that I've been making in my Colette piece to the effect that uh, racism has been exaggerated as a causal factor in creating black-white disparities. Um, black people should not appropriate historical grievances that they didn't themselves experience to justify double standards for themselves in the present. Uh, he, he, he would take a very similar line on these issues and cannot get himself published in the campus newspaper where you'll regularly see op-eds in the campus newspaper saying things like uh, white people should not purchase Black Lives Matter t-shirts, let alone wear them, um, to defend the, the Columbia core curriculum, which is uh, a, a staple of Columbia's education where you, you read the Western canon, Plato, Aristotle, all the way through uh, uh, 20th century. There's an op-ed... To, to defend that is to be indoctrinated by white supremacy, right? So, so that stuff will pass muster with the campus newspaper regularly. Weekly, you will see this, this kind of line taken. And you will just get, you'll just never get, you, you cannot get through the door with, with takes like, t takes that I have. Um, so I guess I'm, I'm just trying to highlight that just the topic of race is so radioactive that you could you can be a Hillary supporter like I am or was you could, you, you can, you can just, you can agree on everything else and just dissenting on the topic of race isn't, is enough to get you socially flamed. Why do you think that is? Any idea? I think, I think probably many reasons. Uh, one, one, I think just the videos of, in the smartphone era, era the, the videos of unarmed black people getting killed by the cops are so emotionally salient to people. And we're so liable to not look at statistical trend lines and to, to interpret one-off events as trends. Um, I, I, think, I think that has something to do with it. I think white guilt has a lot to do with it. Um, just the, the sense the sense that a white person might ha have, obviously not all white people have, have this sense, but many white people have this sense that their being white makes them sort of metaphorically complicit in the long history of slavery and Jim Crow. And that um, there's a kind of moral vacuum there. And uh, uh, they, they sort of, they need to, be responsive to the dispensations that black people ask for in the name of racial uh, uh, equality. And um, there, there's a kind of, there's a kind of guilt there. There's a historical guilt and there's a way in which many uh, black writers and activists exploit that guilt or, or not consciously necessarily, but there's a way in which their rage perfectly plays to that guilt uh, in a dynamic that is really hard to step out of without being seen as racist or insensitive. You said early on in this conversation that it was kind of a throwaway comment of yours that you objected to being referred to as a person of color without your permission. What, what, no, what sorry. As a, no, 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 no. She, uh, she said all people of color are victims of oppression. Oh, I, I, objected, I objected to being labeled as a victim. I, I misunderstood. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Tell, yeah. Okay. So you're not a victim. Uh, race no. doesn't adversely impact your life. Uh, no. Are we still here in America? I mean, isn't there uh, white supremacy? Isn't there implicit bias? Uh, didn't Starbucks happen in Philadelphia? Aren't these videos indicative of a reality of uh, 
uh, law enforcement uh, abuse of their prerogatives uh, against uh, disproportionately against African American males. Uh, have you seen the inner city of Bed Stuy or Harlem and so forth? You see how so many of our co racialists are living. Uh, I thought you were woke, brother. <laughs> Uh, well, there's a lot there. One, uh, uh, no, I'm not a victim. I'm I'm incredibly lucky. Um, it's not to say I've never experienced a microaggression. Uh, a few months ago, somebody at Columbia said that I was very articulate and that I sounded like Obama, right? So that's a classic microaggression. The kicker is that this person was black. And the kicker is I, I took it as a compliment because I am articulate. And, uh, you know... If 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 articulateness is is a trait that happens on on a, on a bell curve like many other traits, then to be above average is something one could be proud of. Maybe one should be proud of. And I take compliments. I tend to take compliments at face value. Okay. So Starbucks. Um, are the police racist? Uh, obviously, if you look at one-off videos of a, a cop killing an unarmed black person. There's something so emotionally intolerable about that, that it seems like cold. It, it just seems emotionally cold to, to insist that we look at statistics in the, in that, in response to that, because it, it's, it's just, it, but if you do look at the statistics, like I'm, I know that you have, I'm sure that you have. Yeah. You will find that white people get killed um, in in many of the same situations, and it it's just not as publicized. I imagine because it, it doesn't the headline doesn't read as salaciously. I, I you know I, I can't I, I can't imagine any other reason why why these things don't get publicized. Um, I saw your recent conversation with Adoner Usmani. Uh-huh. Um, in which you talk about how much of the disparity between blacks and whites in incarceration can be attributed to bias and how much can be attributed to differential rates of offending. And I think somewhere in there, he, he, he said something like four or 5% can be attributed to bias. If let's just stipulate that that's true. Maybe it's higher. Maybe it's lower. Yeah, it's higher. I mean, uh, there are various estimates. He, He was using a 20%. He says of the total disparity, at most 20% can be explained by bias Almost. based on some studies out of Carnegie Mellon and, and other places that people have looked at the data. But uh, it's a guesstimate. But, yeah, that's what he said. Okay. So bias is real. Um, some, some ways of cashing out the term systemic bias are, are I'm totally fine with and, in fact, would agree with. The question is always – how much of the disparities we see between black people and white people are actually accounted for by systemic bias. I think, I think uh, people, many people on the left reflexively assume that systemic bias is not only present, but is a causal factor in explaining various disparities when there's plenty of evidence that, for example, I mean, one, one touch point is a study done by, uh, researchers at, I think, NYU Business School in Columbia that was p- reported on in the, in the New York Times a few years ago, they did a, a classic cold call study where they, they send uh, sh- professors cold emails, identical emails with different sounding names to different ethnicities. You find that, you all, as you always do, that the white, the white names get the highest rate of response. Uh, I think it was followed by Hispanics in this case, and then blacks, and then bottoming out that list were, were Chinese sounding names. So there's, there's some yeah. robust evidence of systemic bias, right? It's unconscious bias. They're not doing it on purpose. None of these professors are overtly racist against blacks or Chinese people. And yet you're at a disadvantage in that scenario. If you happen to be black or Chinese, which is, I mean, that, that is, that is an injustice from, from the, I mean, it's a, it's an injustice in some sense of the word, it may not be a social injustice. It might be more of a, a cosmic injustice, as Thomas Sowell likes to say. But you would you would never see that study and then say and then assume that Chinese people must be doing worse off in, in our society because of it. In fact, when you look at the data, the opposite is true. 
they uh, on average Asian Americans make more money than whites uh, enroll in college at higher rates, etc. Yeah. So um, I, I just I think the me, me, the causal link between between systemic racism, d- depending on how you define that, and unequal outcomes is assumed and rarely proved. Let me let me just make a couple observations. Let me, you say something about the power of the videos showing, and I just got sent one. Uh, Mesa, Arizona Police Department, shown by a security video inside of a apartment building, punching out a black guy who seems to be not doing anything wrong, just standing there. And, you know, the video shows police officers' frontal fists going into this guy's face, his head going back like that, him sinking to the ground. Now, I didn't see what happened before. I don't know the whole context of the story, but I do know that that video had me at the edge of my chair and it had me angry because... It certainly did seem to be depicting someone who was abused. But I say to my students all the time, I say, man, we're in a country of 300 million people. There are hundreds of thousands of encounters between police officers and citizens on the streets of the various cities and towns of the country every day. You can't use a handful of videos, 50, 100, to draw any valid conclusion about the character of those interactions, broadly speaking. You have no choice but to go to statistics. And people will respond, how bloodless. Um, how, how uh, you know, uh, uh, sort of bereft of uh, any sort of sympathetic human understanding about what people are going through. And I'm saying we don't know what people are going through. That's the whole point of trying to look at the evidence. We, get, we don't actually know what the facts are. And I, I just want to say one more thing on this issue of uh, uh, race and police force. I, I, I think you can make a case that uh, police often act in ways that are not consistent with the uh, highest understanding of what their uh, duties are and responsibilities, but they act that way toward white people as well. Uh, we've talked about this here at the Glenn Show. I've had this fellow, Peter Moskos, the criminologist at John Jay College Criminal Justice City University of New York on the program more than once, M-O-S-K-O-S. Interested parties can look him up at his website, copinthehood.com. Cop in the hood. This is Peter Moskos who served for some time has a PhD in sociology from Harvard, but he served for a period of time as a police officer uh, on the beat in Baltimore, Maryland, uh, before he uh, finished his dissertation. Anyway, Peter chronicles case after case after case of police abuse in which the victims are white, including shooting unarmed people, uh, you know, uh, beating up people for no good reason, so on and so on. So, you know, I I think those things really need to be, uh, really need to be said. Yeah, and I think... On the point about statistics, what I, the the way I like to think about it is, if something has a one in a billion chance of happening to you every day, it'll in this country, in a country of three hundred plus million, it will happen twice a week. So if someone is there to film it, you, you know, you could get two events a week of something that has a like literally a one in a billion chance. Of happening to any specific person every day so it will make it seem like this is some widespread phenomenon when when in reality it's not right i mean if we were to talk about the heuristics that people use to assess risk in other areas like an airplane goes down and we see the crash and it's on the front page of the newspaper and then some people are afraid to get on airplanes and fly even though the chance of you dying on an airplane uh is vastly lower than the chance of you dying covering the same distance in an automobile or a bus. Uh, that is a bias of perception that, uh, you know, people can understand something similar to that. Someone tells me, if I get pulled over for a traffic violation and a police officer who's white comes to my car, I'm afraid for my life. I think that they're engaged in a similar kind of perceptual or cognitive mis estimate of the nature of the risk that they actually face. But because it fits a narrative, and I'm sorry, you're supposed to be doing the talking, not me, (laughs) because it fits a certain narrative about the experience of African Americans, it tends to to win out over uh, other kinds of uh, ways of processing the evidence. That narrative is extremely seductive and attractive, it would appear, to a lot of people. Uh, you, You say... Uh, that you're an objecting to a kind of grievance orientation. But why? What's wrong with it? Uh, it it's, uh, speaks to the lives of so many people of color. 
uh, it sounds so compelling to so many who are out there marching and protesting, NFL football players included, people on the streets of these cities where Black Lives Matter have organized. Um, it's uh, resonant with the history that African Americans have experienced. You say oppression of our ancestors, but not oppression of us. We can't uh, rightly adopt uh, a sense of grievance because of something that was done to others. But if it was done to my ancestors, it was done to me in a way because the generations are linked over time, because the resources available to parents or grandparents influence the opportunities that are available to children. Um, you know, because the sensibilities of people living amongst us right now are formed in part by the uh, facts that were uh, uh, characteristic of our history. So, so I'm, I, I'm, I'm, I guess there should be a question here. Um, what's wrong with African Americans today who may not themselves be impoverished or, uh, you know, subject to the depredations of Jim Crow, segregation or whatever, identifying with and appropriating um, a sense of grievance uh, from what had been done to their ancestors because they believe, those African Americans today believe, that many of the problems that beset our community right now are in fact, the consequence of what was done to our ancestors. Well, yeah, I, I think w what's wrong with it is that it has a price tag. And that price tag comes in the form of the fact that um, so many topics that, that so many topics on which the suffering of, of many black people hinge are unmentionable, unable to be talked about precisely because they do not fit into the narrative that uh, the, the narrative that is motivated by the kind of uh, the, the, the identification with the past history of oppression. So, for example, if you want to talk about the harm that the acting white meme does with with young black boys, you're going to run into the brick wall of, you know, Vox.com. I mean, they have a piece, um, for, for instance, uh, you know, cher cherry picking, cherry picking studies to show that the acting white phenomenon is not real or not important, and that it's it's merely justifying a kind of right wing uh, bias. This association with the the history of oppression, it has a price tag in the present. You know, if you if you want to talk about the effect of acting white on young boys, you're going to run into the brick wall of the fact that many black people black academics and journalists will get angry at you and re recite the laundry list of things that have happened to black people in this country and stand on that moral authority to shut you down. If you want to have an honest conversation about the problem of murder in certain high crime enclaves of color and all of the externalities of that, um, you're going to run into the brick wall of you're trafficking, you're trafficking in old stereotypes. Don't you know that X, Y, and Z have happened to black people in the past in this country. And how could you not see this conversation in the context of that? It's like, okay, well, are, are you willing to just tolerate the fact that, you know, some seven or 8,000 black people die in this country, just in concentrated really in a few communities? Um, are, are we willing to tolerate that in the name of kind of, in the name of a, a reverence for the history of oppression? Uh, are, are we willing to not be able to talk about these things? Do we treat any other ethnic minority that has had a, a rough past in this way? Do we treat Jewish people in this way? Um, do, do, we, do, we, do we treat Asian Americans in this country in this way? I don't think so, no, certainly not as much. And the, 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 just the fact is we, we, we're in the present going forward right now. We have to have a conversation about just how to affect the best consequences for black people, for white people, for every ethnic minority, for Americans as a whole. And that, that effort is not helped by constantly having to reference uh, oppression that happened to the, most of the people talking about these issues have no direct personal experience with. Okay, uh, let me just explain to people, if there is anybody who doesn't know, when you say acting white, you're referring to the observation that there's peer pressure amongst um, African-American youth to discourage people from engaging in intellectual activity or academic achievement, saying that the person who does so is, quote, acting white, close quote, seeing those kinds of activities of uh, 
being focused on their schoolwork and trying to get good grades and get into a good place as being in some way or another a racial betrayal. And you're making the observation that it's hard to call attention to this phenomenon. People will um, feel that you're doing something that's uh, morally problematic. In fact, as an African-American, you raise questions of this kind or complain about this. And I can imagine a counter argument, which would go that um, these cultural um, arguments you're going to, next thing you're going to be doing is telling me about the broken African American family. You're going to be telling me that the fact that there aren't fathers around to raise these kids has something to do with the high rate of incarceration or something like that. You know, you're, you're, you're going to be saying that uh, people are disproportionately inclined to depend on public assistance instead of standing on their own two feet. I'm not, again, trying to put words in your mouth. I'm imagining what the concerns are of someone who is objecting to the invocation of cultural argument. You're blaming the victim is what they're going to say. You're taking it out of context. Why is it that you think African-American peer groups might behave in the way that they uh, do? Why is it that you think that uh, the out of wedlock birth rate might be amongst African-American what it is or the level of violence in our communities? Uh, Ta-Nehisi Coates famously has made this argument in one venue after another. He's completely through with cultural arguments, it's warmed over Moynihanism is the kind of thing I can imagine him saying, although probably more eloquently than that. Um, and uh, it's a, it, it's in a way, it's a betrayal because it doesn't take into account the fact that the cultural dynamics to which you would so readily call attention are themselves the product of an oppressive history. Moreover, it's exactly what white conservatives want to hear. Doesn't it bother you sleep at all at night, Coleman Hughes, that uh, right-wingers read what you write and then uh, get happy about it and like it? And, <laughs> and, and I don't have read the comments on your stuff, but I can imagine some of these alt-right types might be reading you and saying, finally, a sensible black person emerges. I had had my doubts about that, but right on for Coleman Hughes. It's this kind of thing. So not to say too much, cultural arguments are indirect collaboration with oppression because they blame the victim. That just sums up what I was trying to say. Uh -huh. And you're, you're an indirect collaborator with people who obviously mean us no harm uh, because they cheer the fact that somebody like you is willing to stand up and say what you're saying. It gives them cover, you being black. How do you respond okay. to that? I respond to that by saying everyone, everyone in their life has the friend who had a very, very rough childhood and ended up somewhat psychologically broken because of that and ended up engaging in certain self-destructive behaviors because of that. And you want to help that friend. You, you want to help that friend. And yet, no matter, no matter what you do, you cannot do it for them, right? It, it could just be the case that you are where you are by no fault of your own. And yet, you know, it's unfair from the point of view of the universe, but it could be the case that you're the only person that can move yourself forward. That scales up to entire communities, in my view. And the notion that blame has anything to do with what I'm talking about is just confused. Because I, I, I don't think blame is a philosophically coherent concept at the end of the day. None of us choose our genes. None of us choose our environment. And yet we have every reason to believe that those two things combine to create the psychological profile that motivates our behavior in each moment. Our brains are who we are and our brains are following the laws of physics, whatever they turn out to be. And none of us chose those laws. Um, so the, the sense, the sense, the, the, the idea that any of us is deeply responsible for uh, who, what the type of person we become is, is irrelevant to the question of how we increase flourishing going forward. Moreover, I can simply stipulate for the sake of argue, for the sake of argument that every element of black culture that I would want to critique is itself a knock on consequence of slavery and Jim Crow. That is totally irrelevant to the question of how we have an honest conversation about improving those elements of the culture that do need to be improved going forward. Um, and then to, to address the second half of your question, I'm, I'm aware that many alt-right people would, uh, you know, would see what I write and say, oh, thank God, a black person making sense for the first time, et cetera, X, Y, Z. Um, 
given the choice between that, uh, obviously that does not make me happy, but given the choice between lying about what I believe or being cowed into silence about what I believe and saying what I believe and being liked by people who I would find to be unscrupulous in other areas, I mean, th th those are not, that's not an ideal choice for me, but I don't think life owes you ideal choices. I think I would rather take the latter option and say what I think. Okay. Then let me just uh, push on this cultural question uh, one more time. Um, okay, so now we're going to talk about it. You, you're objecting that people don't want to talk about it? Okay, so now we're going to talk about it. What good is talking doing? Um, you can't push on a string and reweave a fabric that's been unraveled by having pulled on that string. Exhortation? When has that ever been shown in human history? Exhortation. Be better. Uh, live better. Uh, when has that ever been shown to actually transform anything? Um, it is uh, performative. It is uh, expressive, but it's not especially helpful. What we need are policies. Those policies require resources. And the political basis for having those resources appropriated depends upon people more or less accepting the narrative that I'm trying to foster as a progressive uh, social justice race person and that you are uh, impeding uh, with, your, um, with your critique. Uh, so if you really care, I mean, this is how the argument is going to go, believe me, I've heard it. If you really care, instead of uh, giving ammunition to the uh, people at... Uh, Breitbart.com or Tucker Carlson or somebody, uh, you'd be talking, but you'd be talking in church basements or something like that to African Americans who might be able to hear you in context and be to some degree moved by that. And moreover, you'd be mobilizing politically to get the resources in hand because the public conversation, I mean, communal conversations are one thing in the church basement. The public conversation needs to be about politics and policy, uh, not about uh, school marmish lectures to people uh, to, uh, you know, pull up their socks. My response to that uh, would be, A, I don't, I don't know. Here, here would be my response to that. I'm, I'm profoundly skeptical that there is some policy that's going to come on from on high that is going to fix the, the cultural issues that I'm pointing to. What, what, insofar as you think the acting white phenomenon is real, which I absolutely do, and insofar as you think it's doing real work in keeping otherwise intelligent black boys from fully realizing their potential in a 21st century information economy that is based very much on academic effort and on not being socially penalized for raising your hand a lot in class, if you think that's a problem, there is no government policy that is going to fix that. that. That government policy is just not the right kind of tool to get the job done. And my other response is, can you name a single other ethnic minority in the history of planet Earth that rose to economic prominence by petitioning the majority for special dispensations? Because I can't. I'm not saying there is no such case. I'm not a historian. So I'm happy to get the angry email from the historian who knows the one time that this has happened. But I think what, why, why should the burden be on me to explain why, why self-help broadly construed is not the best option? The burden should be on the other people to give me a single example where policy has worked. Let, let me underscore one thing that you just said, which uh, I think is so, so true. I've even said it myself from time to time, which is this. What's the logic in thinking that this racist uh, hegemon, that this uh, all-powerful and, uh, you know, uh, have contempt for our humanity, disrespect our body, would hang us from a tree if given the chance, white man and woman, the establishment, the white establishment, the powers that be, would be responsive to our pleas of, uh, for more diversity and inclusion and whatnot, given that they're racist, that they're prepared to elect somebody like, quote, the racist President Donald Trump and so forth, given that they're all consumed by their privilege and unaware of it and so forth, why would appeals to them uh, be expected to be met with any kind of constructive activity that would be helpful to us? I mean, if indeed we're right in the indictment, 
then we should we should not have anything invested in the expectation that uh, having issued the indictment, the response is going to be somehow helpful to us. Those are the same people, I would have thought. So so there just seems to be a logical problem there. Uh, have you read uh, on this uh, acting white thing? Have you read uh, Thomas Chatterton Williams' book Losing My Cool? I have not, but it's on my short list. Highly recommend it. Uh, this is a forty-something uh, uh, writer. He's in Europe right now. Thomas Chatterton Williams also grew up in suburban New Jersey, as I imagine you did. Um, and uh, his father's got a PhD. I think it's in sociology. He's of a mixed race. His mother is white. Father is black. And I won't go on very long about this, but the memoir tells of his high school and early college years uh, coming out of uh, a uh, middle class. Uh, it was a mixed, uh, racially mixed community, but he hung out with the, the brothers, you know, and, and he wanted to be black and cool. And he was and how he dressed and played basketball and the girlfriend that he hung out with. And whatnot. He gets to Georgetown University. And after a year in which he hung out partying at Howard for most of the time and didn't go to class. He kind of comes home, has an epiphany, gets back in his sophomore year, gets on a different track. Is uh, reading philosophy and uh, literature and history and stuff like that, and and quote unquote loses his cool, which is to say, comes into a sense of understanding about his identity as a black man, biracial black man, uh, that uh, doesn't any longer impede his acquisition of you know his intellectual growth. That that doesn't sort of blinker him and narrow him down to, well, I don't listen to jazz music because that's uncool. Hip hop is the thing that you listen to. And I don't read Chekhov because that's uncool. Toni Morrison is the thing that you're supposed to be reading. Like you have to choose between those two. You don't, of course. Anyway, uh, it's, it's brilliantly rendered this, uh, end of the, uh, advert for, uh, Thomas Charrington Williams book, but I do highly commend it to you. What's wrong with affirmative action, my brother? Uh, there <laughs> wouldn't be any black people at Columbia or Brown University to speak of. Maybe you would have gotten under the wire. Maybe I could have gotten hired in the economics department. Who can tell who would know? Basically, we know that the numbers would be practically zero if we didn't have affirmative action. Why are you in a hurry to take us back to this, the de facto racial segregation in American higher education, elite American higher education that characterized the scene before affirmative action came along? Yeah, I think, ironically, I'm, I'm fairly torn on affirmative action. I think there are some good arguments for it that the proponents of it never really make. Um, I think I think justifying it by reference to historical oppression is a disaster because you have to deal with the fact that Asian Americans were locked out of land ownership in the early 20th century, lynched in the 19th, interned in the case of the Japanese, etc. If you want to diverse, if, if you want to justify it in the name of diversity, I think I think there are some there are some fair arguments that diversity is a goal worth striving for in some form. But like I pointed out in my, uh, my my blog post, it doesn't really make sense that we have black student housing and that there is a separatist strain on campus that is sort of permitted to d- do its separatist thing when the justification for the fact that some of those kids are there is ostensibly to foster inter-ethnic dialogue and um, just to, to the, the mingling of the different ethnicities so that we get past this whole race thing. Um, so I think there's diversity is my instinct. I couldn't support this with data, but my instinct is that it's not stupid. Diversity is not totally stupid. Um, you, you can also justify it just by, by referencing the fact that there is still a, subtle, implicit psychological stigma on black people where, um, you know, people, people notice walking down the street that the black people they encounter are more often behaving in a certain kind of way than the white people. And their brain subconsciously uses skin color as a heuristic for bad behavior. And maybe, maybe affirmative action, a small amount of it corrects for that. Um, I, I don't think that most of the proponents of affirmative action in my experience have made very good arguments in favor of it. It's, it, it seems to be something that people, it seems to be a kind of sacred policy. For, for instance, if you Gallup polls, if you just poll people, what they think of, of affirmative action, you get very high levels of support. 
But then if you ask, do you think race should be at all taken into account in college admissions, you get less than 50% support among black people and white people. And yet those are synonyms in, uh, as I see it, which tells me that affirmative action has a kind of sacred veneer around it, a kind of political aura where it becomes a badge of who I am as a person to support it. And uh, I, th I think just going forward, are we going to have affirmative action 10 years from now, 50 years from now? We have Asians suing Harvard over this. I think it's unsustainable. M maybe it made sense for a few decades. Maybe, it, maybe it'll even make sense for a few more decades. But eventually, we'll, it will have to be stripped of its sacred quality so that we can be honest about its consequences. And you know, ultimately, people care about fairness too much for this to be a, a policy that we have forever. So eventually, eventually, we have to talk about it. We do have to talk about it. I, I definitely think we're moving into the forever territory here. Um, I, I would just add to what you said. I think it's useful to distinguish between goals and, and means. I think the veneer of respectability or even uh, the imperative that people might uh, uh, attach to affirmative action has to do with the goal of having institutions being open to a diverse set of communities being concerned that you'd have elite venues. There's a debate, as you may know, going on with regard to the uh, exam uh, for uh, the special high schools in uh, uh, high achieving high schools in New York City's public school system, where um, black and Latino are whatever percentage of the city's population they are, you know, 20 percent, I'm guessing it's a number like that, but are whatever percentage of those who are enrolled at the Bronx High School of Science or Bet's, Bet, whatever the schools are, exam schools, that number is in the single digits, maybe even below 5%. So there's, there's concern about that. Um, and, uh, the idea that you would want diversity, that you'd want inclusion, that you'd want institutions to be open, that you're concerned about underrepresentation, that's a goal. The means, selecting people in a competitive admissions process where you have substantial differences in the academic qualifications of those who succeed, who belong to, let's say, Asian, and those who succeed who belong to, let's say, black, the means uh, might be problematic. So it, that's not hard for me to see people rejecting the idea that race would be a factor amongst the means and yet accepting the idea that racial diversity would be an ideal toward which they should strive. And of course, differential admission standards are not the only ways in which society can pursue the means of having there be more uh, matriculants who are from these uh, communities of color disadvantaged communities of color at, uh, at elite uh, venues. Uh, selective admissions is one thing that you can do. Enhancing the development of people before they get to the point of competing for admissions is another, broadly speaking, thing that you can do. So these things are not, I don't think, um, necessarily in contradiction with one another and aversion to racial discrimination in college admissions. There's no way around, as your Martian had to discover, there's no way around the reality that this is racial discrimination. I mean, what else can mm -hmm. it be? You look at people's race and you treat them differently. That's just the literal definition of racial discrimination. Aversion to that on the one hand, and yet affirmation of the goal of, of more inclusive and diverse institutions on the other. Those things I don't think are logically inconsistent with one another. Uh, but the, the permanence, and you know, this is something, again, I've, I've said here, and I'll, I'll stop. I want to hear more from you. Uh, the idea that we, we move toward a regime in which... Um, as an ongoing matter of managing uh, the difficult social problem entailed by the need to ration access to the resource of elite higher education. Okay, so that's a problem because not everybody can, uh, by definition, not everybody uh, can have that benefit. So um, that we would settle into a permanent racialization of the admissions uh, procedures where the rationale is, uh, and again, you, you point out the kind of contradiction. The rationale is we need diversity because it's a pedagogic imperative. We can't really educate our young people unless they're able to learn from each other through uh, this cross communal uh, interaction that takes place on our campuses. And yet, when people get to campus, their uh, identity uh, maintenance and, Afri and, and uh, assertion uh, demands we want a house, we want a dorm, we want a program, we want a space, we need a space, uh, which are segregated in their, uh, in their effects, seem to counter the very rationale for having brought people in in the first place. 
And yet to me, this underscores uh, another problem, and maybe you'll agree or not, I, I'd like to hear, uh, which is about the indignity of it all. I mean, uh, the Asian student over here is here because uh, they maxed out on the GRE or the SAT. Uh, the African-American student is here, although they didn't max out, because we need to have diversity. Uh, might not an African-American student legitimately object to being reduced to the uh, uh, you know, instrumental role of providing diversity? That's what I'm good for. I'm good because uh, you're counting beans and I'm the right color bean for you to make your count. Uh, that's a little bit of a, of a uh, kind of disrespect, isn't it? Uh, so, I mean, I don't know. What do you think? Uh, yeah, I mean, I can't say personally that I've ever felt personally disrespected or, or that I've ever, ever personally felt the doubt that many beneficiaries of affirmative action have expressed, which is, do I belong here? Was, was I just brought here as a kind of token? I haven't personally felt that, but I, it seems like a, a rational thing to feel. Uh, I think diversity in general, uh, the Certainly the conversation around it is not, it's not dealing with many of the questions that you uh, posed. For example, why, why when I peruse the Columbia newspaper am I seeing op-ed after op-ed after op-ed by bright young black students who are constantly pushing a kind of intellectual and artistic separatism, accusing people of cultural appropriation, um, telling, black, telling white people what they can and can't say, what they can and can't believe. This is the norm. You should you should just take a moment to per peruse the Columbia Spectator, uh, you know, uh, the op eds. Although it's summer now, so they're not running, but m maybe just take it on faith for me for for a moment that this is the norm. Um, wait, well, what? That that makes no sense to me given the goal of diversity. Um, moreover, it's not absolutely clear. I, what I do find insulting is the idea that a ho a homogeneous group of of black people couldn't possibly learn well on their own i mean the, the idea that you have to be in contact with other eth ethnic groups and races in order to do well s seems like pretty ridiculous to me my, my grandmother went to dunbar high school famous high school you're probably familiar with in washington yeah. dc yeah. many books have been written about it because it was an all-black high school before desegregation that consistently outscored yeah. the local white high schools on standardized tests. Everyone in that school is black, and yet they were doing spectacularly. I, 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 I find the tacit assumption that black people need to be around white people in order to do well, um, and that I mean, it seems to me people sort of assume that without arguing for it. Um, I find that somewhat insulting. I of course, I, I prefer I prefer ethnic diversity. I think it's a good thing. I just don't see why it is a absolute prerequisite to the success of black people or any ethnic group. The Japanese seem to be doing very fine in Japan with hardly an ethnic minority to be found. Wakanda forever. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. And, uh, but, but that, I mean, the other point there is just that if you were to actually do an honest reading of who the black students at Columbia and Harvard and Princeton are, you'll find that something on the order of 40%, maybe more of them are black immigrants and their children, yeah. people from Nigeria and Ghana and Jamaica and Barbados. I know. Um, and, yes. they're, and, and yet they make up something like a 10th of the U S black population yet. They're, they're killing it. So, I mean, their skin color is clearly not a barrier in the same sense. Yeah, it's hard to avoid thinking that culture has a lot to do with these outcomes when you observe things like this, which, by the way, uh, you're echoing Thomas Sowell here to a certain degree. He wrote about Dunbar High School. You're echoing Clarence Thomas, who uh, famously has made these statements in Supreme Court opinions about affirmative action, in which he said it's degrading the black people, the supposition that uh, we can't learn, prosper, excel, uh, except in proximity to uh, white people. Um, and I have to tell you, having attended Howard University's commencement this year, because my grandson took a degree there, um, I saw a whole lot of black excellence and a whole lot of African-American people who were doing some interesting stuff and learning Dad a whole lot of Howard. stuff. 
Uh, so, you know, there, I think there's a lot to that. Uh, I want to talk about the core curriculum at Columbia University for a minute, if I can. Uh, let me let you know that my son, Nehemiah, is an alum. Uh, I'm familiar with the Columbia Spectator, although from years past, he left in 2013 with a bachelor's degree in astrophysics. Um, but he, he took the uh, courses in the core curriculum, which delighted me. I'm an old fogey, okay? To me, I think you, you kind of like, you read the classics, okay? You, you, you kind of like, you're getting an education. This is the one time in your life when you're actually getting an education. Uh, I don't see anything wrong with reading little Hobbes, little Locke, little Rousseau, little Kant, little Smith, whatever. I mean, that's, that's all. You're good. saying them like they're rapper names. <laughs> well, they are in a way, in, in a certain genre of rapping. <laughs> <laughs> these, these brothers were laying down. <laughs> no, okay, I'll, I'll stop. I'll stop. Uh, <laughs> but uh, uh, this kid's an engineer. He's a data scientist. He's uh, he's out in Silicon Valley now doing what he's doing. And enough about him. Uh, he got a really good education at Columbia. And I'm wondering what's wrong with the core curriculum. I mean, I'm shocked. Shocked. Uh, oh well, that, let me give you the argument then. Yeah, let tell please. Well, don't you know, Glenn, that. Um, the, the core curriculum is it's just a form of indoctrination into white supremacy holdover culture where you're meant to think as a black person that your ancestors did not contribute enough to the canon of world intellectual history to be included at a rate that to, to be included in proportion as black people have existed, which is to say, if you're reading 20 authors this year, and, you know, it's only W.E.B. Du Bois is the only black person, let's say. Or we have W.E.B. Du Bois and we have Gandhi. And all of the other 18 people are black. Not to mention women. There's only two women in there, let's all say. All the others are white. You said black, you meant white. Sorry. Right, right, right. Um, so we, we only have Mary Wollstonecraft and uh, Simone de Beauvoir. Everyone else is just straight, white, cis men. How can you possibly expect a black person in that environment to feel that they're valued, that to feel that the environment that is selecting that syllabus, that extremely white syllabus, could possibly have respect for the value of black intellect um, when they choose when, when, they, when, when they choose the syllabus to be that white? That's the argument. Okay, I'm 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 just gonna play along here, a naive critic of that argument. How silly! Uh, the, these were <laughs> the Enlightenment happened in a particular historical time and place. Okay, there's no. I mean, uh, the Chinese have a great civilization going back millennia. The Indians have a great civilization going back millennia. There were civilizations on the African continent that were great in their respective ways that go back some some period of time. Uh, it's no, what, what is whiteness got to do with, uh, I mean, take science. Is there, is, is there, I mean, when the Nazis said Jewish science about guys like Einstein, we can all see in retrospect just how mad, I mean, insane, I mean, racist that was. What did his Jewishness have to do with the value of his reflection about relativity theory? Likewise, uh, if I'm looking for the foundations of our liberal contemporary socio-political order, that is, for example, the primacy that's given to the individual, individual person, the dignity of the person, okay, which lies at the root of all these claims about equality across various social designations. Where did it come from? Where did that idea come from? That I didn't just fall from the sky. Yes, it's largely a Western idea. Is it exclusively a Western idea? No. Ought we to be try to be mindful of the extent to which other cultures might have also dealt with these uh, profound philosophical dilemmas and questions? Yes, of course we should be. But they're foundational texts. That there's not a um, uh, there's no committee of uh, of cisgendered white males who are up there deciding uh, which books uh, that uh, come to us. Uh, Shakespeare, uh, Beethoven. I mean, is there other music? Yes, of course there's other music. Uh, anyway, I'm sorry. No, Am I getting yeah. through? I mean, uh, yes, this totally, is an yeah. old funny duddy over here, guy who's saying, uh, I thank God that I got, it was a long time ago, I graduated from Northwestern University, undergraduate in 1972. I grant you that that was a long time ago. Thank God it was before these police started coming around telling me that I couldn't read these classics because I actually got the education. 
at Northwestern University that I pri- uh, prize and cherish to this very day, okay, in the speech. Right. So my, my friend who I mentioned earlier, Christian Gonzalez, he, he wrote a, a piece essentially defending the core in the terms that you just did. And he got a response that was quite popular and widely read at school saying that he must be indoctrinated into white supremacy holdover culture. Um, and I, I essentially wanted, I, I wrote a response to that response, um, essentially arguing what you just did, which is that, I mean, the, the irony here is that if you want to read the first anti-slavery texts, which is to say the first texts ever written that have been preserved, that objected to slavery on moral grounds, to say that it, it is wrong in all cases for X, Y, and Z philosophical reasons, I'm sorry, you're going to be reading texts that were written by white men in Europe and America. If you're not interested in reading the first anti-slavery text, you don't have to be interested in that. But if you are, you have to absorb the fact that history did not distribute wealthy societies equally. It did not distribute societies with a robust intellectual culture and publishing companies equally. History is not fair. We can't go back and retrospectively pretend that history was fair by pretending that 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 intellectual discoveries were evenly distributed over the surface of the earth. So that was the argument I made. I got some I I had some trouble getting it published, but eventually I did. Um, Suffice it to say that the the devil's advocate argument I gave before is in that newspaper that will be the norm. I, I don't know how much it's the norm, actually, if you polled Columbia students. I get the sense that if you polled them, many more people would be open to the argument you and I just made. Um, but, of course, there is the impression given by the fact that the newspaper just takes this stance or, or basically endorses this stance and has a stunning lack of viewpoint diversity that the argument against the core is is more valid than I think people would actually claim that it is, if that makes sense. Yeah, it does. Um, I, I feel myself getting older with each passing day, because I guess I am aging at the rate of one day per day, <laughs> but, but it's starting to feel like a year per month these days, because I'm so out of step with all this stuff that's going on. I really appreciate you coming on and, and talking to us. What's next for you? You say you're a junior, are you? Yeah, I'm going into my junior year. You're going in next year to your junior year. Right. You're completing your sophomore year. Or you just completed your sophomore year. Uh, what You got plans? Uh, do, you, do you know now what you might be doing when you finish your uh, studies at Columbia? Nope. Yeah. I enjoy writing and reading and speaking, and I could see myself doing all of those things. I enjoy philosophy, um, and I... I have no concrete plans. Okay, well, you got plenty of time. Coleman Hughes, thank you again for uh, sharing with us. And everybody out there, check him out at uh, Quillette.com and elsewhere because he's worth, he's worth the time. Thanks a lot, Coleman. Thanks, Glenn. You're welcome. Okay, I'm going to...